The subject of today's session is Isaiah chapter 13. As we've noted on many occasions in the past, the division of the books of the Bible into chapters is relatively late and not especially authoritative. So we'll be discussing Isaiah chapter 13 together with the first two verses of chapter 14 that are thematically and structurally conjoined with it. But now, as we consider this chapter, it becomes immediately clear to us, it poses to us a great set of challenges. Let's begin by considering the opening verse and what it tells us about the content of the chapter that follows. Read the burden of Babylon in translation. In the Hebrew, the word that introduces this prophecy is masa, which indeed generally means burden or load. And maybe there's an implication here of just how heavy and terrifying the prophecy that follows is. We should be noting this opening word because it is indeed the opening word of the whole set of prophecies in this subunit of the book of Isaiah, beginning in chapter 13 and continuing through chapter 23. And one of the very apparent themes of these chapters, aside the burden of prophecies of retribution and destruction is the prophet envisioning something that to us seems awfully elusive. What is he telling us here about the destruction of Babylon? Maybe the more crucial question we should be asking here is why is he telling us about Babylon at all? We should note that this is the first place in the book of Isaiah in which Babylon appears. But then, if anything, our question ought to be, why does Babylon appear at all? It was not a major player in the time of Isaiah, certainly not in our part of the world. Babylon rose to prominence only long after the career of Isaiah. And of course, at its zenith, destroyed the kingdom of Judah and burned the temple and exiled Judah from its land. We read here, not of those events, but of something that happens 70 years afterward, the destruction of Babylon. Why is the prophet describing an event that takes place roughly 170 years after his life and career are over? And again, what is it conveying to us? We should note as a prophecy that perhaps most dramatically illustrates this point in Isaiah chapter 39, we get a sense of just how irrelevant Babylon is in our part of the world in the time of Isaiah. At the beginning of chapter 39, we read, at that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent a letter and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and was recovered. In our tradition, he heard of the miraculous recovery of King Hezekiah, and there's a vivid, detailed description of the welcome that Hezekiah gives to his guests, showing them all of his treasures, and in verse three, then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, what said these men, and from whence came they unto you? And Hezekiah said, they are come from a far land unto me, even from Babylon. Do 
it almost seems as if King Ezekiah doesn't even know much about Babylon other than that it's far away. And Isaiah tells him in verse 6, Behold, the days come that all that is in your house and that which your fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says God. And of your sons that shall issue from you, whom you shall beget, shall they take away. Babylon will rise to prominence. Babylon will conquer Judah, will destroy the temple, will exile Judah from its land. But all this is remotely in the future. Now, ironically, on the one hand, Isaiah chapter 39 exemplifies just why Babylon shouldn't even be a subject of a discussion in Isaiah. But it also indicates why it ought to be. Obviously, Isaiah, as a prophet of God, is not limited to the here and now. And just as God's word in chapter 39 tells him of the fate in store for Judah at the hand of Babylon, so too in our chapter, in chapter 13, the word of God tells him what is in store for Babylon itself on the day of God's reckoning. But now, while we can understand then in general outline what the purpose of this prophecy is, we still need to ask ourselves, what is it for? What is it teaching us? What is the message that Isaiah chapter 13 communicates to us as its readers? And maybe on the most basic plane, what we should stress in this regard is the crucially important message that there is the great playwright who writes the drama of world history. As we read later on in Isaiah, in chapter 41, verse 4, who has wrought and done it? He that called the generations from the beginning. I, God, who am the first, and with the last, am the same. Everything that unfolds over the course of history is already part of the script that God has written. And there is, perhaps especially in that vein, particularly significant meaning in a prophecy of the destruction of Babylon written by the prophet Isaiah so many generations before it will take place. This, in our tradition, is an implicit message in the prophecy of our father Jacob in Genesis chapter 28, where Jacob, as we read in verses 12 and on, dreams of a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reach to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, God stood, we could read the continuation as over him, referring to Jacob of, or over it, over the ladder. So we see the imagery here of a ladder upon which angels are going up and going down. And God is over it all. One of the interpretations in our tradition, these angels are the heavenly officers appointed by God over the nations of the world. As we read in the book of Daniel, the officer of the kingdom of Persia, the officer of the kingdom of Greece, and so on. And each nation rises, and then it falls. Reaches the zenith of its career, and descends into oblivion. That succession of kingdoms is part of the divine drama unfolding in the world. As we read, perhaps more cryptically, but also more explicitly, 
in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel sees a frightening vision of four terrifying beasts. And the interpretation given him in verse 17 is these great beasts, which are four, are four kingdoms that shall arise out of the earth, but the high holy ones, or alternatively, the holy ones of the most high shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. God's kingdom is handed over by proxy to these great nations who hold sway over humanity for a period of time. A period measured by God precisely until the time has come for the next kingdom to become ascendant, to have its moment upon the stage, its dominion over the nations that surround it until it in turn is eclipsed by the nation that comes after it. And this succession is the means through which God's kingdom is possessed by proxy by the nations pending ultimately the establishment of the kingdom of God through his holy ones. It's an ongoing progression. An ongoing progression that perhaps is most aptly expressed by Isaiah telling us about not merely the rise, but the fall of Babylon so many generations before it will actually come to pass. Now, we've noted in the past that in attempting to extract a message from the words of the prophets, it's important for us to understand what the prophet was communicating to his contemporaries, and then to ask what in that message pertains to us. Here, the question is further complicated by the extent to which, in what we read in Isaiah chapter 13, it doesn't seem that there's anything really immediately even accessible to the prophet's contemporaries. Well, the truth is we don't know how much Isaiah actually communicated here. And perhaps we should invoke in this regard what we read in Isaiah chapter 8 in verses 16 and 17. God saying, bind up the testimony, seal the instruction, the Torah, the teaching, among my disciples. Seal it up. A book that may not be intended to be read at all by Isaiah's contemporaries. Rather, I will wait for God, who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope for him. And I entrust these prophecies to the students who will bear them with them for all the intervening years until the time will have come to unfurl them and read them before the house of Judah and Israel. The time hasn't come yet. And it could very well be that these prophecies weren't even intended for the contemporaries of Isaiah. They are rather tantalizingly intended more for us. And that may also bring us to considering in an additional vein, the structure of this opening verse of chapter 13, where besides reading that it is the burden of Babylon, we read specific ascription to the prophet Isaiah, which Isaiah, the son of Amos did see. Now, it might strike us altogether as superfluous to refer to the prophet in his own book. But then, if these prophecies were maintained as a written account for later generations, it doesn't seem so strange at all. The prophet, so to speak, signs off on these prophecies. So we know this is the burden of Babylon through the agency of Isaiah. 
And maybe it is in particular important for us to stress that this is the prophecy concerning the destruction of Babylon of Isaiah, because at the time of Babylon's ascension, we read the words of another prophet addressing the self-same subject. Jeremiah chapter 50 begins the word that God spoke concerning Babylon, concerning the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. So to distinguish one from the other, Isaiah chapter 13 is the burden of Babylon of Isaiah. Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51 are Jeremiah's prophecies concerning the downfall and destruction of Babylon. Indeed, culminating as we read at the end of chapter 51, when Jeremiah writes all of these words in one book, as we read in chapter 51, verse 60, all the evil that should come upon Babylon, and gives this book to Suraya and says to him, when you come to Babylon, then see that you read all these words. And he charges him to say, oh God, you have spoken concerning this place to cut it off, that none shall dwell therein, neither man nor beast, but that it should be desolate forever. And it shall be when you have made an end of reading this book that you shall bind a stone to it and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates. And you shall say, thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise again because of the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. And these are the final words of Isaiah's prophecy. Thus far, the words of Jeremiah, that's it. After these words, in the book of, of Jeremiah, we encounter only chapter 52. We've noted in the past that Jeremiah chapter 52 is almost a verbatim restatement of the final chapter of the book of Kings. The message of Jeremiah culminates with the fall of Babylon. Isaiah conveys a similar message. Indeed, a message that features many of the self-same themes that we encounter in Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51. A message, again, in general terms, that communicates that there is a master playwright. The drama of world history is authored by God. But now let's consider in somewhat greater detail just what this prophecy is communicating to us. Verse 2, set you up an ensign upon the high, the tranquil mountain, lift up the voice unto them, wave the hand, that they may come into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my consecrated ones, a statement, as it were, attributed to God. Yea, I have called my mighty ones to execute my anger. This theme of God summoning the enemy is one we encounter repeatedly in Jeremiah as well. In chapter 50, verse 2, declare you among the nations and announce, set up an ensign, announce and conceal not. And likewise, in chapter 51, in Verse 12, set up an ensign against the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong, set the watchmen, prepare the ambushes. For God has both devised and done that which he spoke concerning the inhabitants of Babylon. In verse 27, set up an ensign in the land. Blow the horn among the nations, prepare the nations against her. Call together against her the kingdoms of Iraq, Mini, Ashkenaz. Appoint a marshal against her. Similarly. Returning to our chapter in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 4, God, the God of hosts, appoints officers over the host of the battle. God and the weapons of his indignation are come to destroy the whole earth. Or alternatively, we could render it as the land of Babylon. Now, 
there is inevitably a dualism here between God being the author of it all and the nations. God is summoning the nations to destroy Babylon. But do the nations even realize that what they are doing is the fulfillment of a divine mission? Likely not. But then it's important for us to recall this is a theme that we have had occasion to discuss previously as well. When we consider just what the role of our choices is and God's plan, we read in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, a man's heart devises his way. That's the domain of our free will. That God directs his steps. That's the domain of God's plan. Likewise, in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, there are many thoughts in a man's heart, but the counsel of God, that shall stand. And perhaps most concretely, in the fourth chapter of the book of Esther, when Mordechai charges Esther to intercede on behalf of of her people with the king and he senses her hesitation in going forward with that mission we read in verse 13 his stern words imagine not to yourself that you will escape in the king's house more than all the jews for if you altogether hold your peace at this time then will relief and deliverance arise the Jews from another place. That is, you're not going to determine what the unfolding drama of God's governance of the world will be. That's God's domain. There will indeed be relief and deliverance for the Jews. And if it won't be from you, God will ensure that it will come from someplace else. So you might think it doesn't make a difference what you do. It does. But not for the relief and deliverance, rather for you. If you hold your peace, you and your father's house will be lost. Because in general, God as the master playwright who has given us this drama of history unfolding in the world is also the one who dispenses to us all the roles that we will play as part of his cast. But he doesn't tell us what role that should be. It's up to us. He gives us free will. Free will to choose, on the one hand, to ally ourselves heart and soul with God's plan to do our utmost to advance that plan to its blessed conclusion and by so doing indeed to play a crucial role in bringing god's plan to its fruition or it's possible for a person to choose to oppose god's plan to do his utmost to thwart the plan to strive to derail God's plan for the world. He won't succeed in derailing the plan. Not only that, he will advance the plan. He'll also have a role to play in God's cast of characters on the stage of history. But whether he will succeed in destroying is himself. You and your father's house will be lost. It's up to us to choose what role we want to play. But whatever role we choose to play, we're going to be in a cast of characters. We can choose to be with God or strive to be against him. We can't choose in significance because whatever we choose will indeed be advancing the plan. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 8, when we read the commandment, that when you build a new house, you shall make a parapet, a railing for your roof. 
that you not bring a liability of blood upon your house. The verse states, reading it literally, if the faller falls from it, if the faller falls from it, he hasn't fallen yet. Who determined that he's a faller? Well, we know who determined that he's a faller. Just a, a few minutes ago, we considered Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4. God is the one who called the generations from the beginning. This one has been designated as a fuller for whatever reasons known to God. You might think that if God has already designated that he's going to fall, so why should you bother making a railing around the roof? And the answer is, again, it's up to us to choose whether we will be the instruments through which God's benevolence comes into the world or through which God's punishments come into the world. If you don't put a railing around your roof, you bring a liability of blood upon your house. The fact that the one who falls has been designated by God as the faller will not exempt you because it was your choice. What happens to the fuller is God's business, not yours. God summons us all. It's up to us to choose how we respond to that call. We've noted in the past, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 10, a verse whose Hebrew text is open to various interpretations, but a verse that I am rendering here, perhaps most literally as, great is he who performs all. Well, we know who that is. And God in performing all hires the fool and he hires transgressors. That is, he hires everyone. Everyone is going to be in the cast of characters. But someone who gets incorporated in the cast of characters as the fool, or as the transgressor, may, by dint of the choices that he makes, choose to bring about his own destruction. He will advance the plan. He won't be irrelevant. God will give him the role that he has by his choices and his deeds chosen for himself. It's always up to us. So this then describes the general background. That is, God is issuing the summons. There will be nations that will come in serving as the instrument of God's indignation, God's punishment of Babylon. But it's not just about Babylon. We noted in our chapter, in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 5, that the enemy coming to serve as the weapons of God's indignation is coming to destroy the whole earth. Now, we could render these words as destroying the land, referring to Babylon. The same word in Hebrew, after all, Aretz, can refer to all the earth and to just one land. And at some plane, of course, it is Babylon that is being subject to destruction, but we find repeatedly the themes in this chapter are themes of the final judgment of the world. In verse 6, howl you, for the day of God is near, as spoiling from the Almighty shall it come. Now, we've noted in other contexts that we have another verse in the prophets, Joel chapter 1, verse 15, that is almost verbatim identical to the words that we just read in Isaiah. Alas for the day, for the day of God is near, and as spoiling from the Almighty shall it come. It's significant to note the name that we're using here for God, translated into English as the Almighty. In the Hebrew, Shaddai. Likewise, in the words of Isaiah, Keshod Mishaddai, as 
spoiling from the Almighty shall it come. There is a kind of alliteration in saying spoiling from the Almighty, that is, the realization, as we've noted elsewhere, that this name of God, indeed, is understood by many scholars as etymologically related to the word for spoiling. The spoiling from the ultimate spoiler. What a strange way of referring to God, until one considers that this is precisely the point. We have many other examples in which the doom of both nations and individuals is described with this verb. In Isaiah chapter 15, likewise, the burden of Moab, Moab is spoiled. Kir of Moab is spoiled. In Psalm 91, it is conversely the promise that God will save us from the destruction that spoils at noonday. This theme of spoiling, as we've noted, pertains to a world that, on the one hand, is entirely subject to the control and dominion of God but that God operates in this system, plundering, spoiling it, by God's might, channeling the world in the direction of fulfillment of the mission that, she, that he has designated. And so indeed, pertaining to this name that can be a divine name, we've noted that Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 24, can be read as referring to the voice of the Almighty, or simply a mighty noise. The theme of might is something manifest in the destruction of Babylon, but it's more than just the destruction of Babylon. And this, again, impels us to consider what is meant by the day of God being near. It's not a pleasant day. That seems clear. In verse 9, we read about this day once again. Behold, the day of God comes, cruel and full of wrath and fierce anger. Once again, the ambiguity. Is it just referring to the land of Babylon to make it a desolation or to make the earth a desolation and to destroy the sinners thereof out of it? And even on a cosmic plane, the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened, his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. This global and even cosmic turmoil is all indicative of final, ultimate, divine judgment. And this, of course, is a theme that we find repeatedly in the Bible. Just to consider very briefly in overview, in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 8, for God is a day of vengeance a year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. And similarly, in Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 10, for the God of hosts shall have on that day a day of vengeance that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And indeed, likewise, in Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 3, the day is near, the day of God is near. It's a day of clouds, which is also, again, a way of describing darkness. And it is the day upon which a sword shall come upon Egypt and convulsion shall be in Ethiopia when the slain shall fall in Egypt. A day of cataclysm, a day of destruction. Similarly, in Joel chapter 3, verse 4, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of God shall come. There is a promise. Whosoever shall call in the name of God shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those that escape. But they're escaping because the entire world is in the grip of this terror. And again, continuing in this theme, in Joel chapter 4, we read of God's judgment of the nations. Verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of God is near in the valley of decision. And once again, the recurrent theme 
cosmic turmoil, the sun and moon darken and the stars withdraw their shining. Similarly, in the vision of Ovadia, in verse 15, for the day of God is near upon all the nations and the theme of vengeance, of recompense. As you have done, it shall be done unto you. Your recompense shall return upon your own head. Well, so far, in all of the carefully chosen illustrations, the day of God is the day of God's vengeance upon his enemies, the enemies of Israel. But of course, we realize it's really not so simple. In Isaiah chapter 2, we saw this. It wasn't speaking of the enemies of Israel. On the contrary, in context, it was Israel. In verses 11 and 12, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and God alone shall be exalted in that day. For the God of hosts has a day upon all that is proud and lofty, and upon all that is lifted up, and he shall become humble. That day of God is a day of humbling for everyone. Israel and Israel's adversaries. Everyone who has turned his back on God. And so we well understand the words of warning in Amos chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Woe unto you that desire the day of God. Wherefore would you have the day of God? It is darkness and not light. It's a vivid metaphor, verse 19. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him and he came into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of God be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? And so we find in the prophecy of Hosea, which is explicitly a prophecy of rebuke to Israel. In chapter 9, verse 1, Rejoice not, O Israel, unto exaltation like the peoples. For you have gone astray from your God. You have loved the harlot's hire upon every corn threshing floor. And by consequence, they shall not dwell in God's land. And the rhetorical question, the biting, terrifying question, in verse 5, what will you do in the day of the appointed season, in the day of the massacre of God? Because it's coming. In Joel chapters 1 and 2, we read of the cataclysm that took place in the days of the prophet. Specifically, it was, of course, a plague of locusts. But here, too, the implications in terms of the day of God are far more vast than one specific cataclysm. We already saw in Joel chapter 1, verse 15, the warning, alas for the day, for the day of God is near, and as a spoiling from the Almighty shall it come. But to whom is this addressed? Well, in verse 13, it's, gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Well, you ministers of the altar. It's the spiritual leadership of Israel. In Joel chapter 2, likewise, beginning in verse 1, blow you the horn in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land quake, for the day of God comes, for it is near. And again, it's a day of cosmic significance, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness as blackness spread upon the mountains. In verse 10, referring to the army of locusts and its devastation, before it the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon darken, the stars withdraw their shining. For great is the day of God, and very terrible. Who can abide it? So, this day of God is terrifying not only for the enemies, but also for us. 
in Sifania chapter one, likewise, we're considering these illustrations briefly, obviously much more to be said about them. But in verse seven, the day of God is at hand, it is near, for God has prepared a slaughter. He has consecrated his guests and it shall come to pass in the day of God's slaughter that I will visit upon the princes and the king's sons and all such as are clothed in foreign apparel. These are Israel. Those who have earned the destruction through the choices that they made. Verse 14, the great day of God is near. It is near and hastens greatly. Even the sound of the day of God, wherein the mighty man cries bitterly because there is no one to save you. In verse 17, I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against God. Verse 18, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of God's wrath. Again, the ambiguity, is it the whole earth or the whole land shall be devour, devoured by the fire of his jealousy. And in Zephaniah chapter 2, likewise, referring explicitly to the rebuke of the shameless nation with embarrassment, that's Israel. In verse two, before the decree being forth of the day when one passes as the chaff, before the fierce anger of God come upon you, before the day of God's anger come upon you, seek you God, all you humble of the earth, that have executed his ordinance, seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you shall be hid in the day of God's anger. And this perhaps is most terrifying of all. It may be, but it may not. And that description of the day of God, we read of the darkness when you expect the light in Amos chapter eight, the land quakes, it shall come to pass. In that day, we read in verse nine, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon and I will darken the earth or the land in the clear day. You know, this theme of darkness as expressive of divine retribution darkness is one we've already had occasion to discuss in Isaiah as well. In Isaiah chapter 5, in verses 25 and on, in speaking of the cataclysm of God's judgment with respect to that derelict vineyard that has rebelled against God. On the one hand, in verse 26, we read similarly to the words that we saw in our chapter, in Isaiah chapter 13, as well as in Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51, he will lift up an ensign to the nations from afar. He will hiss unto them from the end of the earth and behold, they shall come with speed, swiftly. And in describing what follows. In verse 30, they shall roar against them in that day like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold darkness and distress and the light is darkened in the skies thereof. Likewise, in chapter eight, in verse 22, they shall look up onto the earth and behold trouble and darkness. Weariness of oppression shall be driven into thick darkness. Again, that message of divine retribution. And while in all of the foregoing examples, it's something of an abstraction someplace in the future, we also read the same theme very concretely with terrifying concreteness in Ezekiel and in Lamentations pertaining to the actual destruction that takes place, the destruction of the temple. In Ezekiel chapter seven, we read, 
their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of God. In chapter 7, verse 19. In Ezekiel chapter 13, a prophecy that is addressed to the false prophets. In verse 5, you have not gone up into the breaches, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of God. And that day is coming. We read of the day of God's anger in both the first and last verses of Lamentations chapter 2. In verse 1, oh, how has God covered with a cloud the daughter of Zion in his anger? He has cast down from heaven unto earth the glory of Israel and has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. In the final verse, verse 22, the final words of the chapter, there was none in the day of God's anger that escaped or remained. Those that I have dandled and brought up has my enemy consumed. Now, with these words, we inevitably confront an additional theme, perhaps the most terrifying theme of all in our chapter in Isaiah chapter 13. You know, the day of God, the day of God's vengeance, even the day of God's slaughter, on some plane, we appreciate is the day of recompense. The wicked have earned it and they will get as the harvest that which they sowed. That maybe on some plane we can accept, but what about all of the collateral damage? What of all the innocents? And this indeed is a terrifying theme in our chapter. In particular, from verse 15 and on, everyone that is found shall be thrust through. Everyone that takes refuge shall fall by the sword. You might think these are culpable adults, but we're not finished. Verse 16, their infants also shall be dashed in pieces before their eyes. The houses shall be spoiled, their wives ravished. Behold, I will rouse the Medes against them who shall not esteem silver, and as for gold, they shall not desire it. Verse 18, and their bows shall dash the young men in pieces, and they shall have no compassion on the fruit of the womb, for their eye shall not have pity on children. Infants, children, innocents, and their suffering dashed to pieces. As we saw again in Lamentations at the end of chapter two, those that I have dandled and brought up, the children, has my enemy consumed. This is a theme that recurs. We encounter it likewise in Ezekiel chapter 21. This is likewise a prophecy of retribution against Jerusalem. Thus says God in verse eight, behold, I am against you and will draw forth my sword out of its sheath and will cut off from you the righteous and the wicked, not just the wicked, also the righteous, seeing then that I will cut off from you the righteous and the wicked. Therefore shall my sword go forth out of its sheath against all flesh from the south to the north. The destruction is not limited only to those who by their choices have so richly deserved it. And this admittedly is a recurrent theme in the Bible. In Ecclesiastes, chapter 8, verse 14, the author bemoans, there is a vanity which is done upon the earth, 
that they are righteous men unto whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. Again, there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. No clarity. The wicked get away with it. The righteous are suffering. I said, this also is vanity. And more expansively, in more vivid detail, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, in verse 2, all things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the pure and to the defiled, to him that sacrifices and to him who sacrifices not. As is the good, so is the sinner. He that swears as he that fears an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. And yet, that's what we see, isn't it? It's even worse. In Isaiah chapter 57, verse 1, the righteous perish, and no man lays it to heart. The men of kindness are taken away, None understanding that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. The righteous go first. We don't have an explanation. I am not going to brazenly attempt to trivialize such a weighty problem with platitudes. But Simultaneously, we should at the very least recognize a verity in God's governance of the world. God establishes an impersonal system. We call it nature. And like all impersonal systems, doesn't relate to every single individual based upon the individual's worth and righteousness. When nature is unleashed as a fury, everyone is victim. Maybe even more strikingly, we consider the miraculous plagues of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 8, before plague number four, which is arguably the first not merely localized plague, God sends Moses to tell Pharaoh, and I will set apart in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell. In verse 19, and I will put a division between my people and your people. Similarly, before the fifth plague, the pestilence that decimates the cattle, the livestock. God will make a division between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, we read in verse 4. And when the plague strikes in verse 6, of the livestock of the children of Israel died not one. Likewise, with plague number 7, the plague of hell smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. Verse 26, only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hell. And likewise, plague number nine, the plague of darkness, in Exodus chapter 10, verse 23, they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. Who? The Egyptians. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And of course, most conspicuously, in Exodus chapter 11, the plague of the firstborn smites every firstborn in Egypt, except in verse 7, against the children of Israel, shall not a dog wet his tongue or growl or whine. Nothing at all against man or beast that you may know how that God does put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Why this extraordinary intervention? Apropos of what we noted with respect to the system, when the plagues come upon Egypt, they become the system. 
the miracle of the plagues is completely sweeping away nature as we, as the Egyptians, had anticipated nature to behave until that day. Once the plagues have settled in Egypt, it is no less of a miracle for Israel to be spared their effects. Because again, once the system strikes, it strikes everyone. Barring an extraordinary miracle, the miracles described here of Israel being saved from the consequences of the plagues, everyone gets affected. And again, returning to our chapter, the infants even are dashed in pieces. Now, we should note a short etymological semantic note here, and that is the expression used in verse 16, the infants being dashed in pieces, employs in the Hebrew the verb yebutshu. Yebutshu, the root letters reish, tet, shin, indeed is a verb that means dashing in pieces. It is an exceedingly rare verb in the Bible. I find it only six times in the entirety of the Hebrew Bible. Two of them are adjacent to one another here in our chapter, in Isaiah chapter 13. In verse 16, the infants also shall be dashed in pieces. In verse 18, their bows shall dash the young men in pieces. Perhaps one of the most jarring expressions being dashed in pieces for the innocent, the infants, the little children. This verb that we discern but six times in the Bible appears, of course, twice in Isaiah chapter 13, pertaining to the enemies of Israel, and specifically to Babylon. Likewise, it appears in the prophecy of Nahum in chapter 3, where the object of the prophecy is the destruction of Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria. We read in Nahum chapter 3, verse 10, yet she was exiled, she went into captivity. Her infants also were dashed in pieces. Third instance of the same verb, same expression. And maybe we'll note, although the verb is different, the idea is similar. In Psalm 137, in verse 9, the psalmist craves for the one who takes and dashes your infants against the rock. Well, these pertain to the enemies of Israel. But simultaneously, we find, just as often, Ratash, dashing into pieces pertaining to the infants of Israel as well. In the second book of Kings, in chapter 8, we read an extraordinary narrative. Elisha, the prophet, being sent by God to Damascus, where the king of Aram, Ben-Hadad, sends his attendant, Hazael, to solicit the guidance of the man of God come from Israel as to whether Ben Haddad would survive his illness. And in the context of the narrative, we read in verse 11, the man of God, Elisha, wept. Chazael, as Elisha apprises him, soon to be the successor of Ben Haddad as king of Aram following Ben Haddad's death, asks Elisha, why is my Lord weeping? And Elisha responds, because I know the evil that you will do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds will you set on fire. The young men 
will you slay with a sword and will dash in pieces their infants and rip up their women with child? So here we have it. Dashing infants in pieces, the infants of Israel. Similarly, in the prophecies of retribution against the kingdom of Israel in Hosea, in chapter 10, we read, the mother was dashed in pieces with her children. And likewise, in Hosea chapter 14, verse 1, Samaria shall bear her guilt, for she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child shall be ripped up. There isn't any monopoly of destruction maintained by the enemies of Israel. The message pertains equally well to Israel. And in particular, in Jeremiah and in Lamentations, which we ascribe to the prophet Jeremiah, the theme of the children, the infants, being destroyed in the events surrounding the destruction is a recurrent one. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 20, for death has come up in our windows, it has entered in our pal palaces, to cut off the infants from the street and the young men from the broad places. So once again, this destruction isn't something that pertains to one group or another, and it doesn't even pertain only to the perpetrators of evil, to the wicked who have earned it. When the day of God's judgment comes, it is a cosmic day of judgment. It affects us all. Small wonder then that we read in Isaiah chapter 66, beginning in verse 15, a terrifying description of what it means to speak of God coming. For behold, God will come in fire, and his chariots will be like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will God enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh, and the slain of God will be many. A terrifying description. And similarly, in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 27, Behold, the name of God comes from afar, with his anger burning, and in thick, thick uplifting of smoke. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue is as a devouring fire. Similarly, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm will rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. And yet, when we consider these words of terrifying retribution in their context, there's another theme that is at least as dominant. Two verses after, in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 27, we describe God coming with his anger burning and in thick uplifting of smoke. We read in verse 29, you shall have a song as in the night when a feast is hallowed and gladness of heart, as when one goes with a pipe to come into the mountain of God, to the rock of Israel. The verse before in Isaiah chapter 40, we read of God coming as a mighty one with a strong hand. In verse 9, we read, O you who tells good tidings to Zion, get you up into the high mountain. O you who tells good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Well, you know, we can understand very well why be afraid. Isn't it terrifying? Do we really want God to come? And yet, consider the message emergent in Psalm 96, beginning in verse 11. 
Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field exult and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood sing for joy. Verse 13. Before God. For he is come. For he is come to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. Similarly, two chapters later, in Psalm 98, beginning in verse 7, let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing for joy together. Why? Verse 9, before God, for he has come to judge the earth. Again, likewise, in the first book of Chronicles, chapter 16, beginning in verse 31, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, God reigns. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field exult and all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the wood sing for joy. Why? The continuation of verse 33, before God, for he is come to judge the earth. Do we really want to be the objects of that terrifying judgment? To witness the terrifying day of the Lord, the day of God's vengeance, the day of God's slaughter? We noted the warning of the prophet Amos. Why are you waiting for the day of God? It is darkness and not light. So why all the gladness and the rejoicing and the exaltation? Shouldn't we just be terrified? But of course, the key. Returning to Psalm 96, verse 13. You know, there was a phrase that was recurrent in this verse. Before God, for he is come. For he is come. To judge the earth. Well, he is come to judge the earth, that's true. But he's come. He's come. The closeness. Isn't that what we've been waiting for? All these years, all these centuries, millennia, for he's come. That's what matters. Everything else is so insignificant by comparison. He has come. He has come. And that makes all the difference. And when we consider in this vein, what's taking place again in Isaiah chapter 13, the cataclysm, again, the terrible suffering, again, the day of God, Again, on even a cosmic plane, the manner in which in verse 13, I will make the heavens quake and the earth will be shaken out of her place. As we noted in verse 10, the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. Darkness, terror. But all means through which ultimately God is manifest which God has revealed. Again, as the master playwright, the author of the drama of the rise and fall of nations taking place in the world, the author of history, God has come. And that makes all the difference. And that inevitably brings us likewise to the culmination of our passage here in Isaiah. As we noted, we conclude after the grievous description of destruction with the two concluding verses of this passage, which are Isaiah chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. For God will have compassion on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the stranger will join himself with them 
and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the peoples will take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel will inherit them in the land of God for servants and for handmaids, and they shall take them captive whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. So obviously one of the themes that is expressed here, and it's been expressed on manifold planes throughout the passages that we've seen today, is God's ledger needs to be balanced. So those who were the captors become captives, and those who were the oppressors will now be ruled over. That's crucially part of the picture, but that's not the whole picture. The essential theme in these words, God having compassion on Jacob, God setting them in their own land, God has come, and that makes all the difference. And when we read then of the stranger joining himself with them, it's not to get the goods, because there's an awful lot of terror and even suffering when God has come. It is rather precisely because God is come that all those who thirst for God's presence appreciate where they need to go. And indeed, it is in that vein that we read in Zechariah chapter 2, in the reckoning here, it's verse 14, in some editions of the Bible, depending upon where chapter 2 begins, it may be verse 10, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come and I will dwell in the midst of you, says God. And that makes all the difference. I come. Hinani ba. I come. And as a result, in the following verse, many nations will join themselves to God in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you. In the following verse, and God will possess Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and shall choose Jerusalem again. It's a promise. The promise isn't easy sailing. No, that's not the promise. The promise more than anything else is, I come. I come and I will dwell in the midst of you. And the many nations that join themselves to God in that day are joining because that's exactly what they seek. And maybe even more glaringly and more frighteningly, when we consider the final chapter of Zechariah, chapter 14. Behold, the day of God comes. What is this day? It's a day of terror. When you're spoiled, will be divided in the midst of you. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. We know the final battle against God is fought here in Jerusalem. And the city will be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city will go forth into exile, but the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. What a terrifying day. It's not over yet. Verse 3, Then shall God go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle. And his feet will stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Now exactly what that means, we'll see. What it certainly means is, he is come. Boy, is he come. The mountain splits. The cataclysm is so great. You will flee to the valley of the mountains. You will flee as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. 
and God, my Lord, will come, and all the holy ones with you. He's coming. And by consequence, verse 9, God will be king over all the earth. In that day, God will be one, and his name one. It's not an easy day. It's a day of terror. It's a day of destruction. It's a day of judgment. But it's the day when God comes. And recalling all the themes that we saw in our chapter and elsewhere regarding the darkness, the cosmic level of the sun growing dark, the moon not shining, all darkness. We continue with the very last chapter of the prophets, Malachi chapter 3. Verse 19, behold, the day comes, it burns as a furnace. And all the willful sinners and all that work wickedness will be stubble. And the day that comes will set them ablaze, says the God of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you who fear my name, it won't be dark, not anymore. Shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in its wings? In verse 21, you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in that day that I do make, says the God of hosts. And finally, the next to last verse in the prophets. Verse 23, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of God. It's coming. And all of the prophecies of retribution and destruction, retribution and destruction of Babylon, of all the wicked, of all the willful sinners, and tragically, of all those who suffer simply because they were around on that day of judgment, all those prophecies point us in one direction, that final day of light and glory, that final day of God. If we ask ourselves, what are we going to learn about the world of the future from a prophecy of destruction of Babylon that took place thousands of years ago? We get a roadmap. We don't know how to read this roadmap. It's still in all. We get a roadmap of the day of God that lies ahead. And indeed, speaking again about the darkness and the light, in Isaiah chapter 60, Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of God is shown upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and gross darkness the peoples, but upon you, God will shine and his glory shall be seen upon you. That's not just for you, because nations shall walk at your light and kings at the brightness of your shining. And as for the luminaries, the sun, the moon, you're past that. Verse 19, the sun will no longer be your light by day, Neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto you, but God will be unto you an everlasting light, and your God, your glory. And so, this prophecy of destruction and doom for Babylon concludes not with Babylon, but with the restoration, not with destruction, but with the promise of deliverance. Because ultimately, there is that heavenly ledger that God possesses that he will balance. And the day of God that strikes Babylon of old is merely a signpost 
on the pathway to the ultimate day of God over all the nations. Isaiah chapter 13, again, as we noted at the outset, is a prophecy that reminds us there is a master playwright. There is someone who runs the show. Isaiah chapter 13 also instructs us that there's a process taking place in the world. And ultimately, it's up to us to choose whether we're on God's side or not. Whether we are on the side that may superficially appear to bear the brunt of the day of God, but ultimately is the receiver of his blessings. May we choose sides appropriately and receive those blessings. God bless you.